The following program is paid for by Jubilee Worship Center, Greensboro. Before the creation of the church, God created the family. And family time is so very important to us all. Welcome to A Time of Jubilee, a program designed to bring the Word of God to you and your family. Dr. Carolyn Lee has spent a lifetime studying God's Word, and she has a right now word for you. Join us now in a time of Jubilee. Welcome to our program. So glad to have you with us, and I hope you'll grab your Bibles as we get to know our God a little bit more. We've been doing so now for several weeks, and I hope that you've been tuning in. Uh, call a friend and have them to tune in as well and join us. Uh, we're going to be looking at how God is our overcomer who then enables us to learn how to overcome. And so um, I wanted us to begin by just looking at a definition of what an overcomer is. And it's actually one who succeeds in dealing with gaining control of some kind of problem or difficulty. And that is in spite of opposition, in spite of difficulties, weaknesses, or frustrations. Now, we would all love to master that. Of course we would. Um, but an overcomer is one who takes the directive. That's one who becomes uh, the one that's on the offensive rather than on the defensive. Now, uh, most people will relate to offensive and defensive when they think about sports. And so we know that someone is operating on the offensive team, a defensive side of the team, and someone's operating on the defensive side. But the opposing one, the one who is our opponent, is the one who wants to win the game and take us out. So therefore, we want to learn how to be overcomers and be on the offensive. And Paul spoke of this overcoming in Revelation 3.21 in the NIV. To the one who is victorious, that means the overcomer, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So let's look at another scripture from Revelation. And we're going to be looking at three different ones. Revelation 12, 11 in the NIV. It says, They triumphed over him, the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Oh, that is a true picture of an overcomer. One more scripture from Revelation 21, 7 in the NIV. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, meaning all of these promises. And I will be their God and they will be my children. And this particular scripture is echoing the promises that are given to the seven churches that are addressed in the book of Revelation. So all of this that we learn from these three scriptures are enough to entice us to want to be overcomers. Yet there is an adversary who has an MO, a modus operandi, who is out to deceive us in every way that he can. And it's something that we need to remember is that evil is not something. Evil is someone. And it is an invisible spirit that attacks us. And behind all evil is a person, a person, although it's a person without a body. So this particular uh, force of evil and all of his cohorts operate out of the second heavens, which is the demonic headquarters. And they rule with rebellious fallen angels. And that, that's who our opponent is. That's who we are to learn about so that we can overcome the one who is the adversary in our lives. Let's look at Ephesians 6, 12 in the NIV. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I don't want us to go too quickly through that scripture. I don't want us to miss the, the word not. Our fight is not against people. And that's something you and I can forget so easily. I know I, know I can in my own life. 
<laughs> it's not against people, although sometimes we're convinced that it is because we see someone's face, we've heard someone's words, we remember something that was done to us. So we superimpose that person's face on it, but we forget that there are forces of evil behind that that's truly the enemy. So Paul is teaching us the enemy target, the adversary who is the enemy of our souls. And we cannot detect his work simply by our senses. It has to be by revelation knowledge that is given to us by God himself. So there's no question, and I believe that you would agree with me, that the battle is real. The battle is definitely real, definitely real and whatever the outcome will be will determine the results of how we deal with life in every other area. And so the enemy is not only working, but he's working not by himself, but with a host of spirits which are discerned spiritually. So Revelation 12, 9 in the NIV, let's look at that. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Not a very pretty picture, is it? But let's look at the, the two descriptions of the enemy. He's referred to, first of all, as a dragon. Now, a dragon is intended to invoke fear. And, and of course, any of us that would be have a dragon loomed at us would certainly be afraid. And, but he's fierce, and he threatens to destroy. So this is one reference to the enemy himself. The second reference is that he's a serpent. Now, a serpent or snake is like it's smaller in size, and it can move about through cracks and small holes and get in uh, rather discreetly. But the motive of the two, that whether it's the dragon or the serpent, no matter how the enemy comes at us, it's come with the intention to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So what does it mean to steal? I, think, I don't think we have any trouble understanding that. It means to take what belongs to us. And some of us have felt robbed. We feel like a thief came in during the night, so to speak, and took that which belonged to us. To kill, of course, is an obvious um, understanding that it means to take life. But to destroy is not only to, to, take, to take life, but it aims into eternity. So the enemy is uh, without scruples. He is evil, and he's mean, and he has ploys that come against us. So we want to look at some of the obstacles that stand in our way when the enemy is attacking us so that we can be overcomers. We can be wise to his tactics and his ploys. Matthew 4, 3 in the NIV says, the tempter came to him, meaning to Jesus, and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So what do we see here? The enemy comes as a tempter. So let's remember that. When, and this is, of course, speaking of Jesus, but it's also what we run up against. So he was enticing him to disobey God and to attract him into temptation. Well, if we're honest, we can all relate to that. We have all dealt with the tempter in some way who's trying to, to get us to disobey God and to attract us into temptation. Let's look at another uh, obstacle. 1 Thessalonians 2, 18 in the NIV says, For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. Well, how many times have you felt like that he was an obstacle that stood in your way? You were on your way to doing something in the name of the Lord, and it just seemed like there was one block after another trying to hinder you from doing Well, that's the enemy, and he's coming to block the will of God because he's a resistor. He's always pressing against that which is the will of the Lord. He doesn't want the kingdom of God on this earth. He doesn't want you to be productive in the kingdom either. So we see him as a tempter. We see him as one who blocks or who is a resistor. And Revelation 12.10 in the NIV says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God 
in the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. So that's the third way that we can identify the enemy as one of the obstacles that comes across our path. He is the accuser. So we see that he comes to accuse us of wrongdoing. Why is he doing that? Because he wants to separate you and I from our God, make us feel guilty, make us feel ashamed so that we can be separated from him. So we learn then that he is out to deceive us, to entice us, to hinder us, and to accuse us. That is the MO. That is the, the, uh, the, those are the attributes of the enemy that you and I run across in our lives when we are trying our best to serve our Lord and do what is right. He's going to resist us and work against us as his strategies. So I'm assuming that you're like me, that you would like to be an overcomer, truly would like to learn more of how to do so. So we're going to have to armor up in order to do so. And we're going to use Ephesians 6. But before we read about these pieces of armor, we're going to read the, the entire chapter. Or we're going to refer to the entire chapter of uh, Ephesians 6 because we don't want to take just the armor of God out of context. So Ephesians 6 begins by giving us instructions first. It admonishes children to obey their parents. And you say, well, what does that have to do with the armor of God? Well, if we're not in right relationship with our parents, what good does it do to dress up in the armor of God? So see, he does not leave anything out. We've got to make things right. We've got to honor. Yes, some, some parents have acted dishonorable. Yes, but we honor the position that God has placed them in. Okay, to honor them that our lives may be long. So our culture is reaping a devastation of the demise of the family. Paul's words here are timeless. He addresses children playing their rightful role in the kingdom of God by obeying and honoring their parents. This is in action as well as in attitude. So unless parents contradict God, children are to obey them. So to honor them is to show respect and to hold them in high regard, meaning their words weigh heavy. What they say weighs heavy with us. We take those things into consideration. That's what it means to honor. And so now grown children, those who are now of age and out of the home, um, who are of mature age, are not held to obeying God, but the, uh, obeying their parents, excuse me, but they are still called to honor the parents. So the second point we will look at just in just a moment, but we're going to hear from our sponsor, and we'll be right back, and we'll look at the rest of Ephesians 6. This is Pastor Carolyn Lee. I'm sitting here studying the Word of God and preparing for our next Healing Ministries Retreat. We have wonderful savory meals that are just so inviting and delicious. We have a good meeting place that can house up to 13 or 14 people at a time. I also have bedding. We have bedrooms where, for those who stay overnight that come for ministry. But the most important thing is that it is a safe place where the presence of God is here. And I just invite you to check out the, our website, HealingMinistriesGreensboro.org. Call our number at 336-272-9910. That's through our church office. They will take your information. I do hope you will come and join us. We'd love to have you. I'm glad you're back with us and we're going to continue in looking at Ephesians 6 because we're getting ready to dress ourselves up in the armor of God, but we're also making things right in relationship with other people. All right, so in the fourth verse of Ephesians 6, and I'm reading from the NIV translation, Paul is speaking to fathers as the head and the leader of the family. It's his responsibility to raise his children righteously. I know we have a lot of those that are living in situations where the fathers are out of the home, but ideally what God has ordained for the family is for the fathers 
to lead the children. And he speaks practically to the fathers and he says, don't stir them up with anger. Don't stir up the anger in your children. Don't correct them in such a way that embitters them. Be an encourager, not a discourager. So this means age-appropriate discipline, not in anger, but in love. So can we see how God is placing things in order before we even armor up to go into battle? In verses 5 through 9 in Ephesians 6, Paul is speaking to those who are servants and those who are masters. God called Adam to work in the garden before the fall. Once the fall happened, work became corrupted. And one way it was corrupted was by slavery. All right, so Paul is calling the church to live with a heavenly perspective. To those who are under authority, he says to serve as unto the Lord with sincerity of heart. The work we offer will be seen by the Lord and he will be the rewarder of that which we have offered. Masters are to address and treat their employees the same way, to honor them and respect them and value them as equal before the Lord. So there's no favoritism with God. There's no place for us to lord over one another. And so he is trying to make all of this in order, again, before we go into battle. How important is it for us to study this chapter in its full context so that we can armor up with weapons of warfare while at the same time, if we fail to adhere to the previous words of truth, then something is going to go awry. People are not our ultimate problem. But see, our attitudes toward people should not be our problem either. We are to get things in right relationship with our Father and with one another. So spiritual warfare then is in the heavenly realm. The daily problems that we face here on this earth are rooted in spiritual wickedness in high places. There's no question about it. So it's important for us to note that the resources that we will need to fight these spiritual forces are also in the spiritual realm. Ephesians 1.3 NIV says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, I'm going to, to tell you as far as I read that is not just being blessed by Him, but we're blessed with overcomer tools. We're blessed with that which we will need to overcome anything in this life. So are the powers of darkness operating in the spiritual realm. We know this, that the battles that we face every day are rooted in the schemes of the evil one. In Ephesians 6.11, NIV says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. So, it's understood that by the time we get to verse 11 in Ephesians 6, we have dealt with the relationships that we've had. We've honored our parents, and we have done all the things that God has told us to. Now it's time to dress up and get ready for battle. So let's not forget that, that all relationships are to be right. So one of the first and most primary tools of the enemy that he uses against us is deception. It's one of his sharpest tools because he knows our weaknesses and he knows our history and he knows our patterns of sin. See, he, he, he has a file on us. He has studied us. He knows you and I. He knows our plays. He knows our weak points. He knows where he can get the best of us. And so his plot is to keep us from experiencing God's will for our lives. So we're going to have to fight the spiritual with the spiritual. If our, in other words, if the evil one in spiritual high places is our enemy, then we're going to have to fight him with tools that defeat him, which are spiritual tools. Human cleverness will not work. It will not. Even whining about him, it will not work. The only power the enemy has is that which we give him. 
I'm going to say that again. The only power the enemy has against us is that which we give him. See, we've been given the tools to overcome. Now, if we're not using them, then we're going to be defeated. We're going to be run over. So over and over again, Paul admonishes us in the sixth chapter of Ephesians to stand. Now, what does he mean by that? That means stay in the area of victory while we're clothed in the armor of God. So there's six pieces of armor that we're going to look at. But they are divided into two categories. The first three items of clothing, that we, of the armor, are with us all the time. The next three we have to take and use as are needed. So we're going to look at them in Ephesians 6, 14, and 15 in the NIV. Stand firm then. Now what did that mean? That means stay in the place of victory. Stand firm with the belt of truth tucked around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, when the soldier went to war, he tucked his clothing into his belt and fastened it securely in order that he would have good mobility. So truth then, the belt of truth, is the measuring standard. So to wear truth as a belt is to live before God's word in his measuring standard. And since the devil is a liar, we must wear truth about our loins to be ready for battle. And see, loins are the place, the, the middle part of our being, where our loins are, are the seat of strength. That's where the strength of our body is. Um, those that work out at the gym, you're, you're told about your core, which is the center of your being. That's where your strength is or where your strength may be absent uh, through weakness. Isaiah 11, 5 in the NIV reads this way, Righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. So to be unfit for battle means that the loins are filled with anguish and are disabled. In other, words, in other words, it's like it's weakened. And this also can affect the bladder and the liver because they're located in that same area. So what goes on spiritually and emotionally can affect us physically as well. So to gird up our loins is to dress ourselves with strength. Remember that the belt of truth is to dress yourself with strength, to be ready to do something bold and courageous, something that takes mental strength. That's why we renew our mind in the words so that we have mental strength, because this is where the majority of the battle takes place, right up here in our minds. So the next piece of armor is the breastplate. And it's important to remember that our righteousness, it's the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness. Our righteousness is not our own. It's an imputed righteousness that has been given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. How grateful we are that we have been covered with his righteousness while meanwhile he's working out and imparting a true righteousness to us as we're being transformed. So when the enemy accuses you and I, we can then protect our hearts with the breastplate of righteousness, with our having right standing with our God, right living based on truth. Then our feet are sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. These sandals that the Romans wore had cleats in them so that they were sure-footed, they wouldn't slip. Many of us have, have walked in slippery places and found that our feet could go out from under us, but not when your sandals have the cleats on them and your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace because you're sure-footed. We take up the shield of faith. Why? Because we're extinguishing the fiery darts before they even get to us. Isn't it better to have the shield out here and let the fiery darts hit the shield rather than to come and hit us? Oh, yes. So the word of God is the best fire extinguisher. So then we take the helmet of salvation, which protects the head, the mind, which is the control center of the body. 
So the truth of God's word in our thinking then guards us and protects us. If we fail to understand what the gospel provides, then we're not going to walk in what God has promised. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, is the only offensive weapon that we have with us. And it's more like a dagger that's intended for hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy. We speak the word and we cut right through the devil's lies. He hates the word. He hates the word of God. In fact, you know, remember when Jesus was tempted, he used the word of God to dagger, to fight the enemy. In finality, we are to stay in communion with our Lord, pray with him, not just to him. Verse 18 says to persevere in intercession for all the saints. How do we do this? By praying in the spirit to have heaven's authority to intervene on the earth, to be in agreement with our God and to pray his word back to him. So when we're armored up, when we're suited for battle, it's because our relationships have been made right on the earth. As far as lies within each of us, we live in peace with all men. Someone else may have ought against you. Someone may be troubled, may not care for you. But as far as our hearts are concerned, we're to be right before our Father so that we are not only just armored on the exterior, but we're armored up on the interior. Because you see, what good does it do to be armored up on the exterior and to have unforgiveness in our hearts? And then we are not in right standing with God. So you see, the armor works both ways both inwardly as well as on the exterior. And so I just wanted us to cover that today so that we can learn how to overcome. Yes, honoring our parents. Yes, Lord, help me. Help me in whatever way I have dishonored in, in the workplace, in any other areas that we have covered in Ephesians 6 today. Lord, convict us where we have been wrong. Show us how to armor ourselves up internally, as well as externally. And I want to thank those of you who have been joining us. I thank you for the donations that have been sent in to help us to remain on the air and to continue this programming. And I hope that you will join me next time in the same place, the same time, and invite your friends to join and bring your Bible so that we can study together. God bless you. It's good to be together today. Thank you for joining us for A Time of Jubilee. To contact us, you can write Jubilee Worship Center at 143 Bluebell Road in Greensboro. You can call us 336-272-9910. You can visit our website at healingministriesgreensboro.org or visit our Facebook page. See you next week for A Time of Jubilee. The preceding program is paid for by Jubilee Worship Center, Greensboro.